What you cooking, Mom? Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking cut. Now I'm gonna you go buy. No, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna go purchase one. That's the I'm problem. Saying, this, this ain't for me. When I was like, you know, the background is mom and dad was addicted to crack cocaine, okay. right? All praises to the Most High. Hi, how are you? I am Doc Holiday, host of the Doc Holiday Show, and as you know, this platform is all about the black man, black woman, black teen, black child, black royal. I am joined by a royal right here. My friend, I mean, one of the toughest people I know, just persevering, a great story to tell. Laquita Wiseman, how you doing, Laquita? I'm doing well. First of all, Laquita, I mean, I know where you're from. Tell a little, uh, the people a little bit about you. Well, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, originally. I've, um, I was born here as well. Um, we stayed a little bit of everywhere in Memphis. Um, started out in South Memphis. We moved to North Memphis for a short time. Um, we lived in Whitehaven. We lived in East Memphis. Actually, we... Started out by, I was Walter Simmons, the apartments. So we kind of lived a little bit of everywhere in Memphis. Hold on. You never told me about Walter Simmons <laughs> now because my, 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 my people used to live in the Get Well Garden. I used to be in the Get Well Garden all the time. And the cats in Walter Simmons used to come over to the Get Well Garden like they was taking over things because get Walter Simmons was so big. So, you know, but it, it was all good. But, you know, <laughs> I'm just glad to have you on the platform and on the show. Right. Now, that's the reason why we have, we're having you here because it's all about uplifting the positive stories. Now, I know now you – uh you're a motivational speaker. You like to speak and uplift people. You do a lot of great things on Instagram. What is your Instagram? What is your Instagram? Uh, Miss underscore Coco underscore Brown. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of the messages you give, you know, being positive uh, and trying to tell people to stay, you know, uplifted. And tell me a little, you know, tell people a little bit about your story. Well, um, for starters, um, I always like to start off by telling people that I was once a high school dropout. Nobody knew that because I um, was one of those kind of persons that I was kind of spoke well. I've always been a person. I was never really a troublemaker or anything like that. So people assumed that I went all the way through high school and graduated. But I dropped out of high school my 12th grade year. And so that was more so the start of me, um, I guess, growing into how, who I will become and who I have became now. Because through that time, I've since then, I've obtained my high school diploma. I did before I even became um, a high school graduate. I was homeless at one time. I was forced to have to raise my children alone while I was homeless. Um, God spoke to me and gave me my, I guess, my purpose while I was homeless. So in in a sense, it's more so um, I learned how to keep fighting, never give up, continue to just fight through and, and get to the finish line so that I can tell somebody else that it's possible. And as far as the children, how many children you got? Two. So um, you 18 and 17. So and going back to that, because I see where you are now and I, I mean, you, you motivate me, you motivate other people. But go, go take us back to that time when you were homeless. I guess you was living in a motel with, 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 the, with the kids. T- take me back to that moment, if, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. So um, what happened was I was living in a hotel. Well, I was working a job and um, I was at this job for probably about almost nine years. And I was a manager at a store. And what basically happened is, is that when you're the manager, you all know that once you're the manager, you're responsible for more so everything that happens in this store. So if there is a blow to the store, you have to take it. If you, you know, take on that responsibility. So what I did, um, the manager came to me one day and was like, there was a shortage. And he didn't know if I had it. He didn't know if the assistant I, that I was working with at the time had it. So I wasn't willing to take the blow by myself. So he basically said, you either going to come up with the money or we'll have to terminate you. So I pondered on it for about three or four days because I think he came to me like on a Monday. And when Friday got there, I said, I'm not going to pay it by myself. So he was like, well, we have to terminate you. And I just was like, okay. So that particular Friday was actually the Friday that I had to pay my uh, rent as well. And so when I went to my rent, man, I paid my rent. And after I paid the rent is when I told him that I was going to actually terminate it from my job and that I would file for unemployment and everything like that. And then so he said, you know, basically – Go and get your job back and we'll work out your rent. I was like, well, it's too late now. And I don't know why I just didn't feel the need to have to reach back out to them and say I want my job back. And so um, at that moment, everything was going cool. You know, okay, I had my truck then, and then things started to spiral down here. I lost my truck at the time. They waited as long as they could on unemployment because I didn't do what the employer wanted me to do. They made it difficult for me to get unemployment. So um, I had to write in to whoever the up person was. I had to appeal it twice. 
I did eventually get my unemployment, but it was at a point where it, it became too late because the you know of course the landlord was like um, you know he couldn't wait no more. So I understood, but in that process, I lost my car, I lost my place to stay. And the most significant thing about it is that when they first came um, to um, put my things outside, the, the, the landlord sent me a message. He texted me and was like, we're gonna, um, we, we'll be there tomorrow for the eviction. So I was reaching out to him, letting him know, like, hey, you know, they declined my unemployment, I have to repeal it. He was patient. And so that partic- one particular time he came, he said, oh, we'll have to, we'll be there tomorrow for the eviction. So I was like, okay. And at the moment, I honestly started praying, like, God, please send me somebody about tomorrow. I need somebody, like, in the morning. This was a sincere prayer. Mm-hmm. And so when the morning came, my friend mom, she stopped by, and she ended up saying, um, I just, you know, I was just stopping by to see how everything was going. And I'm talking to her, and as I was talking to her, she was facing toward me. So she couldn't see the street, but I could. So I told her, I said, this, there's my landlord right there. And she was like, what you mean? I said, he coming to put my stuff outside. So this was, like, in uh, July, close to August. And she's like, okay. She's like, well, I mean, you don't look sad or nothing. I'm like, I don't even know why I can't cry. I don't, I don't know why I can't cry. So he pulled up. The um, sheriff pulled up. The people to change your locks, you know, pulled up. And there was two guys that used to always sit at the end of my street, like, um, drinking and stuff. So they pulled up. I thought they were walking past, but they stopped at my house. And so when the sheriff got out the car, he says, um, he asked me my name. He was like, Laquita, Miles at the time. And he was like, you know what we here for, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, okay, well, when this process starts, you have to actually step off the property. I said, okay. But I didn't tell him that my sister was in the house. So he went in the house. He came back out probably about two or three minutes later. And he was like, um, you didn't pack anything. I was like, no. He was like, why didn't you pack? I was like, I don't even know, sir. He's like, well, um, give me a, a couple seconds. So he walked over to the landlord, and he called me over there. And he said, man, I can't do this. This is what he told the landlord. And it was a younger white guy who mm-hmm. owned the property. He's like, I can't do it. He was like, what do you mean? He's like, I can't put her out. He's like, I don't know why. Just on my heart, I can't put her out. So at that moment, I don't know I don't know what made him. I've never seen him before, so mm-hmm. I don't know what made him, you know, or, or maybe I know God did it, but mm-hmm. he was like, I can't put her out. And so my landlord was like, I really don't either. He said, like, man, what do we need to do? Because I don't, I mean, I can't go through with the process. He's like, well, you know, I got all these people here, you know, the the, the uh, locksmith, all these movers. He was like, and, you know, she's, you know, lost her job. It's not like she working or nothing like that. So I was like, sir, if, you know, if you want to go through the process, it's okay. But as of right now, I don't have any money. You know, um, I'm waiting on unemployment. He's like, well, can you call somebody? I said, well, no, not really, you know. And I said, I can call my coworker. I called her. She only had $100 on her. And at that moment, I knew that God sent my friend's mom over there because she would need to be the transportation to go get the money. So she went to the job. She got the money. She came back, and the, and the guy said, so when you think you'll be able to have some money? I was like, sir, I honestly don't know, you know, because their dad was incarcerated, so it was just us. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, well, I want to work with you. He said, if you can be honest and tell me when you could come up with something or and stick, with, you know, stick to your word, I'll work with you. I was like, I'm being honest. I don't know when I'll get the money, you know. And so anyway, he left with $100. I was more a hundred dollars more in the hole. I don't know who he paid or what he paid to the people that came, but at that moment I knew. I said, you know what? I that's what made me stop asking God for money. It was basically like I'm asking Him for money, and God sent me a person. And everything that they came to do, they didn't do. And so, of course, when time as time went on, I was still applying for unemployment, and I got it um, finally in October. And he sent me another text the night before. At, the, at this time, I had the money, so I wasn't worried. So when he pulled up, I was like, well, I got, you know, the money. I only I only had, um, I think it was like $1,700 back pay they had to give me. And he refused it. He was like, I can't take it. He was like, I can't take it. You know, you, you're you not working, so I don't want to go through this problem again. Somebody else can be renting here. You know, I still pay a mortgage. And it, again, I said, okay, I understand. I appreciate you for even letting me live here this long. I had a friend and pulled up out the blue jet was checking on me. And it, it sounds too good to be true, but it went just like this. There's, I live three doors from the school. So when she pulled up, she said, you know, she was checking on me. She was like, what's going on? I was like, well, the people here, you know, put my stuff outside. Literally, before they put one bag outside, I had ran to the U-Haul place right there on Gitwell because it was a budget, like a uh, auto sales, I mean, budget place. They also had trucks, too. She, I went and got a U-Haul truck. My storage before they can put one bag as fast as they would bring it at the house, we were putting it on the truck. God sent her. She went over to her neighborhood. She got two guys. 
they only tar- charged her twenty dollars together wow. to move all my stuff. So by t- they came about nine thirty ten. It went from our house to the truck. And before my kids got out of school, they never knew that our stuff was on the street. I mean, it never even made it to the street, basically. And that was what I was worried about is some her friends come, you know, getting out of school and seeing stuff on the street, you know. And I just said, I asked her to live with her, and I did for about a month or two. And I still didn't feel comfortable, you know, because I feel like even with us living in a motel, that would possibly be the closest thing to normal. I don't want to have to give the speech about you got to sit down, you got to be quiet, because kids don't understand yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want that pressure on them. So I just swallowed my pride. I was like, you know what? I'm about to go live in a hotel until I can see further. And it turned into an 11-month process. And I I didn't know, but I was just going through, you know. And in that process, I started volunteering at school. And God spoke to me, and he said, you know, this is where you're supposed to be. And prior, 2009 is when he said, um, I want you to preach. But I thought he was saying preach at a church but I didn't know that when I started I didn't know that I had to get fired from my job to volunteer at my son's school because he was in middle school I didn't know volunteering at the school was was gonna give him the opportunity to just speak to me and tell me I should be teaching I didn't know that and so um I volunteered there the entire time while I was living in a hotel and my sister husband so happened to get a, a raise on his job he gave me $230 every Thursday to pay my hotel fee. And believe it or not, shortly after I left that hotel, his job um, closed down. So all of that, I feel like the whole situation and the people that he brought in place was to help me. And I was asking for money, and he was sending me people the whole time. So that's basically the story about you know, me being homeless. And I can't say that I was I spent a lot of sad days because I was waking up every day when my when I take my kids to school and I was saving money every time I would get money because I was still doing a little hurry here and there. I was saving money and, you know, having gas money, taking them to school. And with him playing sports, I didn't have to worry about what we would be doing in the evening time because he was at the school all day. So I would get a ride, you know, to the school to take him to school. I stayed there. I would volunteer all day in his practice. We're in a policy, possibly about 7 or 8 o'clock. So we did that every day. It's like we just went through the motion every day. And I would ask them all the time, like, am I a bad parent? And it was like, no, nah, mom, because you still make it normal for us. You still, you know, you still do. We still do everything. And God was just always putting people in place to help me. Everybody knew that I was always a very present and supportive parent. So any way that people can help, they'll help. You know, from dropping them off at school, picking my daughter up from school, my mom. You know, I didn't put the blame on her because she was, you know, having her own thing going on. She worked, and it, to me, as a parent, it was my job, though, to let my kids see me keep pushing. You know, I couldn't afford to spend days being sad or nothing like that. Because we, I mean, even when we were at my lowest, you know, I would, my son would go outside. I would try, he would, like, do drills in the house. Like, I figured out how to make things work with what I had. Now, how how did you mentally get through you know, that process. I understand living in the motel. What motel? You mind saying what motel it was? Or? It was, it started off, matter of fact, it's crazy that you would say this because we were just on our way here. There was a hotel. As soon as you get off on, um, I guess, like if you coming down Airways mm-hmm. and you crossing over right there at Democrat, there's a hotel right there. That was one of the first ones. And it was November 2014. And um, I, I stayed in there for a couple of days. And then, of course, I went to live with some friends. Um, And then I ended up going to the school next door to Amer- the hotel next to American Way. And that was prob- probably the toughest one because I knew my son was at this school. And I was afraid that people would see him. But we figured out, like, I, and I said this before I had kids, like, I, re- I hope I have kids that we understand each other. And God made it that way because when he, when we lived at the hotel next door, we figured out a plan to, for him to get up early enough to go outside of the hotel where people wouldn't see him walking. So they didn't know that he was in the hotel. They thought he was walking to school with the rest of the kids. And it lasted for a couple of days. I cried when I paid. But um, and on the mental part of it, I just kept saying, God, don't let me lose my mind in the process. Like, keep making me strong, you know. Don't let me lose my mind. I don't want to feel like I didn't. I was probably, that's the first time I had peace, honestly. Because I didn't have to worry about, you know, 
not having the money to pay my car note, not having the money to pay the rent. You know, I knew that I was going to get money every Thursday. You know, um, he was playing ball at school, so it wasn't like I was having to figure out. It wasn't in the summertime where I was trying to figure out what they was going to like. It was financially, it was hard, but I gained a lot of peace because of stuff that I was about to have to worry about. I didn't because I not, not only did I not have those material things, but I also didn't have the money to, I, I didn't have the money to pay if I did have it anyway. So it all makes sense, you know. But. Now you, you were at that you were at that point you and your kids just fighting through persevering being tough I mean dealing with obstacles and situations that a lot of us have to deal with some people worse than you but some people better than you but you still had yourself in that moment and pulled yourself out of that moment because I remember you know your son playing at Whitehaven that's when I saw him hooping just doing his thing I mean just come Alvin just cold you know like oh, right. Why you in that family, man? What's wrong with you? Right. Right. Whitehaven you know what I mean? and he's sitting over there y'all and the daughter but I'm um, just saying just. From there to where you are now, because when I every time I've seen you, you've been positive. I didn't really know you, so you've been positive, always upbeat. And I know you know you've started this whole transformation. So, where how do you feel where you are now, and how did you get from where you were to where you are now? Making a decision. I just said I'm just gonna make a decision. Like the whole process, even with that, and even with this, because I know this is a process, right? So I know if I keep continue to sh to to show people that it can be done then other people are starting to believe it really can be done. So that's why I, I love talking about what got me to where I am right now because really, honestly, what, what um, prepared me for the mental part of where I am now is me being able to fight through the toughest times of my life, you know. Um, every day is more like a, I'm doing it for not me. I'm doing it for somebody else. Like I, I feel like the day that I decide to give up will be the day somebody want to start. So each time I always say, I'm not doing this for me. I got to keep pushing. I'm not doing this for me because it's actually bigger than me. And I figured it out like a long time ago. Now, looking at you, as I said, you've, you've transformed. I know you, you, you've been on your weight loss journey. So you, 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 you are motivation to people on weight loss journey. You motivation to, you know, strong women, black women who, you know, uh, been at their lowers and just uh, pulling themselves up out of it. I mean, how does that feel when people watch you and they motivated by watching you and listening to what you're saying and you're actually able to connect with them? It feel amazing. And even when, like, every day, like, God give me, a, he tell, he send me somebody every day to tell me, do not stop, keep going, I'm watching you. I wish I could become as motivated as you. And, and I tell them all the time, like, listen, all you have to do is have a made-up mind. Like, if you are ready to change, it doesn't take time. It's instant. If you are ready to change, you can do it. And I'm proof. And, and I'm going to keep doing it every day. I show up as your reason and not your excuse. So every day when I get up and I post on Facebook, I do that to make people say, I got to get on up and do what I'm supposed to be doing. Because ain't no way this girl is still a year or something later still, you know, doing the same thing she was doing one year from now. And each year I keep saying, this time next year I want to revisit this same post. And I want to be able to compare and say, hey, I remember when I was making a post about um, starting this and now I'm um, – more in depth of what I was doing, you know, so. And also, you know, a lot of black women, young black women, older black women, y'all going through similar situations as you, you know, they see you, they watching this, they may not know you. What would you tell them? Because a lot of times people be in a deep, dark, depressed state and don't know how to get up out of it. They don't even know the first thing. They can say they pray, but they don't even believe in their prayers. They don't believe God gonna help them. They just they they talk a good game, but and you can't really be mad at them because I've been there before. Mm -hmm. And you like how I'm gonna get up out of this? But me being a man, you know, and I mean, I guess it's just black man, black woman. That's what we do. We just have to deal with. It. I'm like, I ain't got time for no excuses. I got kids to take care of, and I guess you feeling the same way. So, mm -hmm. you know, what would you say to somebody that's in that state, feeling like it's helpless? They're helpless, and there's no way to get up out of it. But you know, it is a way to get out that uh, to get out of there. But they have to just make that first step. I think the first thing would be, first of all, your story and what you're going through is for someone else. You're going to encounter somebody else that will have the same story. And you want to be able to tell them that you can do it. So if you don't start, I tell people all the time, your story is attached to the person that you're going to help. So if you don't start, it's some people watching you. Even with you being at your lowest point, you don't know somebody is watching you. It's somebody that's probably in a better state than you mentally, but not financially or vice versa. So you have to, you start, you have to start so that you can pave the way for the people coming behind you. You just got to make it up in your mind. Like when I made up my mind that I was going to do, I knew it was going to be some people following me. Now how, how, I mean, how, I, well, I know how good it is, but just to have 
some children, some young royals who are understanding, who love you, who supports you, who's not judgmental. Because that's you know that's 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 huge. Because I was you know I got four kids. I got I got three and. Majority of a lot of my adult life when I moved back to Memphis, we had to live in Veronia Square Townhome. Like it's a nice place, but that ain't how I envisioned. You know, losing all my NFL money and trying to, you know, send one to college and doing all those things. And, you know, they never made me feel bad about us living on there. Now Veronia Square, what what camera we on catch? I love Veronia Square. I appreciate y'all. It's a great place. But I'm just saying I just didn't envision raising my kids there. But I know my oldest, you know, just did they didn't ex- you know, it, it was kind of hard on me. So I know people seeing you and you're fighting through that and going through that. Where are you now in the process of your life? Because we talked about what you've been through, but exactly where are you right now? Where is Laquita right now? Uh, I'm actually I launched my business. Um, it's called Let Me Tell You Something. God gave me that name, and and, and honestly, when God created you or He create us. What you're supposed to be doing is already on the inside of you anyway. So when when he gave me that name, let me tell you something. I said, that's why he made me so talkative. <laughs> like, I hated I was a talkative person, yeah. but I've always loved people who can speak well. I've always liked talking to intelligent people. English was always my, always my favorite subject, and I was always a detailed person. So it made sense. So now I'm um basically putting myself in position to be on platforms to, like, speak, encourage people. Um, I'm about to start reaching out to like the homeless shelters, going in, talking to those people, letting them know, like, listen, this is not the end. You know, if you can push through this, it has to be a better side. And it is a better side. So that's basically what I'm doing, just, you know, reaching out, trying to make myself available for um, platforms. And my motto is always, you know, you create the platform, I can capture the people. Because I, I believe I have enough story to tell people that if you start, keep the end. I mean, when you start, Start with the end in mind. So if you stop in the beginning or you stop in the middle, you'll never see what the end looks like. Now have you have you have you stopped letting people kind of dictate your philanthropy? Because I know at one point you was giving food out at the homeless shelter and people always got something to got things say. You know what I'm saying? It's the damn mouth, man. You know, you giving out, they were like, What you showing everybody for? I mean, have you stopped listening to them detractors and just doing you and what the most high is using you to do? Because people gonna always have something to say. Right. And you know what? That was possibly and I'm glad I got it in the beginning. Because in the beginning I was like, Well, maybe, you know, um, maybe I'm doing too much or I don't want people you know, I don't want people to think I'm doing it for the publicity or somebody to look and be like, she's just trying to say she, I, I will, I show people what I do because I want people to know, like, listen, it's some really good people out here mm-hmm. and it's some really good people out here that don't mind doing for other people. So absolutely. I stopped listening to people. All I say is, you know what? You, you'll be asking me, you'll stop asking me why you'll be asking me how in a minute. I'm just keep, I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going. It's either you're going to delete me or you're going to be inspired and ask me how I do it. Yeah, mind your business. Just do what she's doing. Uh, help the people. If you don't, don't want to do it, shut up. Log off. Because if you say something to me, I'm, yeah, you know what it is, but we love each other. Black man, black woman, black team, black child. Now, right now, Laquita, Miss Wiseman, when you look in the mirror and you see yourself, what do you say to yourself? Or what would you say to yourself? Keep pushing. Like, a lot of times, I look at myself sometimes, even with me being with me every day, sometimes I will cry. I'm like, I can't believe I spent so many years trying to figure out what to do, and I'm doing what I used to dream of doing one day, and that's just basically waking up, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, setting the example for not only my young people, but the other people that's older, younger, you know, boy, girl, however. I just can't believe right now at this moment, even with me being with me every day, like I can't believe I'm doing it. And so every day it kind of gassed me every day, like, you know what, I got to figure out something else to do to kind of, you know, Put a little spin on it every day. And also, yeah, I mean, your children, your young girl is extremely talented. And you say your daughter, she, you know, she does pop up shops. She's, y'all just, y'all just entrepreneurs around this one, right? <laughs> right? How about making that money? I mean, just talk about how proud they make you. Really, it it makes me really proud. And I always, we, it's like we gas each other. Like, you know, Alvin with his basketball and my daughter, you know, Nate with her, um, doing, she do bangles, she do, um, Cheer. Where can they she find the bangles? She oh she just she said she still does pop up shops. She'll do pop up shops, but she also have a uh, Instagram page, which is I am underscore I mean I am underscore bang gal. Uh-huh. And she um she made cheer for this year. This is her last year in high school. What high school? Whitehaven High School. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Why my two daughters went to Whitehaven. I'm just joking. I mean, I, don't I, look- know, I, I worked at Furley when it was the it's, it's the new Furley. Yeah, that's that's a different. Not Shelby County. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's exactly. That's green dot. Green I don't dot even know first. what the hell a green dot is. What about red dot? Black dot? Why well, got to be green? You know what I'm saying? But anyway, 
I mean, I'm proud of you. Your story is extremely inspiring and motivating. Anything else you want to add, uh, Ms. Wiseman, before we get up out of here? Just keep pushing. If you don't make it to the end, how would you be able to tell somebody that it's possible? Basically. I just heard that, didn't you? Well, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thanks for having me. That's going to do it for this edition of the Doc Holiday Show. I am Doc Holiday, and as I say, this platform is all about the uplifting of the black man, black woman, black teen, black kid, black royalty, and Ms. Wiseman with her great, encouraging, inspiring story. And so I'm telling, hey, look, I'm getting the sisters on here too. I got it. You know, it ain't all about the dudes. It's about y'all because without y'all, it wouldn't be us. So. Thank her for sharing her story. Extremely emotional, but extremely, extremely inspiring. That's going to do it for this episode of the Doc Holiday Show. Until next time, I am gone. Sending our kids to Whitehaven, but that's all good, Dr. <laughs> Hunter. You my guy, man. What you cooking, mom? You done, bro. What's up? What's up?